welcome everyone to this week's uh, first project seminar. Um, there's going to be another seminar on Thursday. Um, today's talk is given by Ganesh, who is uh, the postdoc here at Leuven, and he's going to speak in part about the adventures in Princeton. Uh, he had, and he'll speak, he'll speak about the work he did, the results um, that came out. And um, the title of the talk is No Boundaries, Data Exfiltration by Third Parties Tracking Scripts. I'm with myself, Ganesh, the floor is yours. Thank you, thank you, Benedict. So this is a presentation that I'll be giving at PETS um, in like 17th of, uh, 17th of um, July, you know, two weeks. Um, the collaboration with Steven and Arvind and Mozilla and Princeton, respectively. So, when you go to a website today, it's almost certain that the website will pull resources from different third parties. Like the, the, these are companies or parties, entities that are different than the website you visit. And sometimes these third parties are loaded on websites that you share very sensitive data with. Um, for instance, on this banking website, um, you see on the right top right that there are 10 trackers or there are 10 tracking requests and you are supposed to enter your banking credentials to, on this website. And it's also true for say for online shopping websites where you are required to enter your credit card details. And you see, for example, here on this uh, website, wish.com, on the checkout page, you, the, the, uh, there are 37 uh, trackers detected. Similarly for maybe like a health related website where you may enter your symptoms to get um, advice, um, there are like many trackers as we see on this um, like popular um, online health related website, WebMD. So all this like sensitive data that you enter or displayed, can a third party scripts um, read them? Like can third party scripts read, for example, your passwords or your username, credit card details? Well, it depends. So. It depends how these scripts are embedded on the web page. There are like mainly two ways. Um, I'm kind of like simplifying here. Um, the first one is uh, embedding scripts using iframe tags. And this actually isolates the third party from the main page, the first part of the page. So this is actually, in, if you consider security, it's like a, the better method. The, the other method is that you may just directly embed the script using this script tags. And in that case, the script will have full read and write access to the page. Um, and the, the basically read and exfiltrate like whatever you enter on the, on the page or whatever displayed to you. So basically the two methods. So why don't the website use the secure method of isolating these third parties from their own like, real content. Um, so there are like there are maybe multiple reasons, but the, the, the main one is this uh, third party scripts may actually require access to the page uh, for to, to provide their functionality. For instance, like imagine a password strength meter library, which there are some. Um, so the, this library, the script, need to actually read the password from the page to actually um, measure its strength. Similarly for um, page or DOM manipulation libraries, for instance, like popular jQuery, they really need to be able to manipulate the DOM this is because that's why you are embedding is for. So I'll be using the, the, the abbreviation, like uh, the, the term DOM um, in the rest of the talk, which is nothing but the uh, like abstraction of the page's contents, let's say. So the, the web pages are represented as a, like a tree uh, model, which is called DOM. And this is how scripts access the pages. So this is just abstraction, but you can, ju you can just like, think it as the pages um, contents. So, we established that third parties actually can access um, the sensitive data you enter or, or display to you on the pages, but do they really abuse their privileges? 
And this is the main question that we try to answer in this study. And we try to answer this question, that question in the context of three specific attacks. First one is login manager misuse. This is a, the built-in login managers in the browsers. Like we are going to see how scripts abuse this, this actually like a, a security apparatus, let's say. Second, um, whole DOM exfiltration, basically scripts that read and send or exfiltrate the whole content of the pages that you uh, interact with and sometimes provide data to. And third, social data exfiltration in which third party scripts basically um, tap into the um, social API uh, scripts that are that are embedded on the page but for providing easy login for example login with Facebook uh, or Google so we are going to like uh, look into uh, look in more detail into each of these attacks but uh, first let me give uh, like a very high level overview of our methods and data collection so we basically developed that what we call the bay technique for this study which is injecting sensitive user data, for instance, credit card details or like a name or some other details into the context of the real um, websites. So that this third party like potentially malicious uh, third parties can read and exfiltrate, basically read and send to their servers. So we, we just make this um, sensitive data available to them to observe whether they read and, you know, um, uh, send them, share them. So the, this um, technique is built on OpenWPM, which is a tool for large-scale web privacy measurement studies. Our data collection consists of a crawl of um, home page and five inner pages of 50,000 websites. So this is in total like a 300,000 pages and for each of these measurements, we did separate crawls, which amounted to 900,000 pages crawled and data collected on. So this is the main uh, high level method and data collection. I'll be giving like more method related details in each specific attack, which we start now. So login manager misuse, um, we uh, hopefully use this tool. It is great to not use not to reuse your passwords across websites. So basically the browser remembers your username and passwords on the websites that you, when you enter them. And this is an opt-in. Basically the browser asks whether you wanted to remember these credentials or not. And then next time you visit the website and need to log in, it just auto fills these credentials for you. However, so these login managers, browser login managers, do not check if the forms, login forms are visible or not. They do not require any interaction with the form. Only browser that required some interaction um, at the time of the measurement was Chrome. Chrome required a user click or touch or on anywhere on the page, did not require the form to be visible or did not require this interaction to be on the form itself. And when the browser autofills your credentials, it does not display a visual indication. Like it doesn't say, okay, I filled your credentials, just so you know, it does not do that. And so maybe you see the, the attack here, the vulnerability here. So when you go to a website, uh, log in, the browser asks whether you want to, to remember your credentials or not. You say, okay, sure, save my credentials for this website. Then you visit another page on the same website. And this time there is this third party script is present on the page. So the third party script injects an invisible login form because you know, the, the form does not need to be visible for the browser to auto fill. And the browser auto fills your previously saved credentials the script reads your credentials and exfiltrates as it, as it likes. 
So this is the base the attack, and uh, I have a like a quick, very quick demo of it. Here is a video. So basically, you go to a website, enter your email address, enter your password, and then you click submit. And then browser asks whether you want to remember or not. So here's our password, fake password. And then you visit another page and the page can automatically retrieve your credentials. So this is done by injecting the invisible form and reading its contents. So for, in order to detect this, we basically extended the, uh, we used Firefox's uh, what's called NSI login manager to add login credentials. We basically impersonated a user who saved credentials for each page that we visit, okay? And then we monitored uh, element insertions, for example, if whether a script uh, injected a form or not, we would know. And then we instrumented these uh, form elements to detect um, when a script read from the uh, read from them, um, and we also looked into uh, requests and responses uh, based on the network traffic from the uh, from the browser, and we required um, like three conditions. First is like the script would inject an invisible element, read the email address, and then sends it or hits hash to a third party server. So using this detection method, we found two scripts um, um, using this technique to basically um, read users' credentials. And the, the first one was present on more than a thousand websites, and the second one was like 63 websites. Um, the, their code looks like this, so I'm not going to go into details, but basically they inject, a, they, they, they do what I explained, like just inject the page and like a check every second whether it's filled or not. And the first script it would send the hashes of the email address to its server, but also sends the MD5 hash to another data broker, uh, like a very big data broker called Axiom. And it actually contained very interesting um, profile categories including like, you know, not only like age and nationality, but like eye colors or hair colors or uh, whether you are seeking for gender, including male, female, and some, some all like uh, other, other categories here. So we saw actually that some of the scripts were embedded on some dating websites. So that's probably how they get these categories, but we're not for sure. And the second script would also send the MD5 hash, but this time along with a, a browser fingerprint, and uh, it was uh, very prevalent on, uh, pre prevalent on Polish websites. So this webs this, this third parties um, advertise that actually like they built this like a user, not, not only by, built user profiles using this technique of tracking, but also like, uh, you know, um, basically sell them so that they advertise that you can buy billions of user profiles. And actually, when I checked today, I think the number was 26 billion user profiles. And then you basically, as a publisher, as a website, can also monetize your database. So you may think, okay, so these like a hash emails are sent as hashes, right? So maybe like, what's the problem? Or maybe it's like, you think it's, uh, it's uh, like, they are like anonymized, which is definitely not the case, but that they play. Basically, like we kind of like along some like site, um, like a research that say, we found that there are actually companies providing, uh, reversing this email hashes as a service that you can actually reverse MD5 hashed emails for like four cents per email. What these companies do is, of course, if they don't break MD5, they just have like a large database of email addresses and then they just uh, look up for the, for the hashes. And the, so the second attack is um, somehow different. It's, um, it consists of sending the whole page contents and the, this is done to basically analyze user interactions. 
say you want to find out how your users interact with your page, like where they click, maybe you want to like draw some heat maps, etc. So this is um, done by what's called session replay scripts. And when these session replay scripts um, collect all this like data, they may also like a scoop up some sensitive data. Uh, so this session replay companies advertise themselves as actually as if looking over your visitors' shoulders, which is really um, the case if you if you look into some examples or demos of these of these scripts. So on the left side you see, for example, like a page, and on the right is the dashboard of the, the this analytics service. So you can see the user going to a form field, entering information. In real time, you can see on your dashboard what user did, what they entered onto pages, forms, whether they scrolled or not. So like all in uh, something like watching a, basically like a video clip. Uh, we have a demo of that on this link. I'm not going to use it now, but so like why website use session replay scripts? So they may find out, for example, who their most valuable customers are. They may find out to find out maybe um, who added items or products to cart but did not uh, purchase them. And actually for analytics or kind of like a debugging purposes, when your websites have some maybe like an issue or problem or like some some like bug that you cannot discover through your test suites, um, but maybe like only occurs through like a specific combination of device or like say screen dimensions, etc. So this, this session replay scripts may be useful for that, like to find out where users, where their users are frustrated. However, the problem is, so this all these recordings, this like collecting all page data, what like whatever displayed on the page um, may result in, um, so basically, so I'm sorry, like first this, this, this like requires not only the, the, the page source, but like your users mouse movements or uh, clicks and key presses, okay? That is like it, it requires a lot of data to reproduce these sessions um, in in a granular way, and the, so the, the way we re detected this session session replay um, scripts is um, first like in in the user browser. So there's the web page which is shown as the HTML here, and then there's a recorder script session replay or recording script like a recorder JS and this third type of servers. So basically the, the session replay scripts um, reads the whole page content and sends it. And so what we did is we injected some unique identifiers into the page and observed them in the next network traffic. Okay, so one problem was compression. So this, some of the scripts like sent so much data that they needed to compress it before sending. Uh, by compressing, I really mean like compressing, like using like gzip or some or some other uh, some other formats. Uh, so to detect this um, this uh, com uh, compressed data, um, um, so we basically um, appended a chunk of 200 kilobyte data onto the page and compared the whether the payload size increased or not. And when there's a like increase in the payload size, we would go and like further analyze the scripts. Okay. So to understand who access the access the page, who read the page contents, for example, we would use uh, JavaScript stack traces. Uh, again, these are all instrumentation added on the on on at the field to open the WPM. And then we also monitored whether scripts um, 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 listens to your mouse or keyboard events or not. We also looked into like HTTP data, like who sent the request, and then the again the again the JavaScript stack traces to basically for for attribute to attribute 
all these say like suspicious events. But basically combining all this, uh, we, we arrived at these um, results and then we found like so many um, different cases where sensed information is leaked. Um, for example, passwords are leaked on certain cases that I'll be showing some examples. Credit card details, for example, on Bonobos, student data, health data, and purchase details. So we observed all this sensitive information leaking to third parties through these session recordings. For instance, on uh, these BEFSA propeller ads, as you type your password, it is sent to this uh, third party session replay company called Full Story. And it's, it's, uh, this happens when you actually um, show your password through this eye icon here. Um, so almost all the station replace companies have some automated reduction. That is, they exclude, for example, password fields from their recordings, which only makes sense, right? They don't want to scoop up your passwords. However, um, their, their, their reduction is based on certain heuristics which fail in, in many cases as, as we found, for example, this like show my password um, um, feature was like a common reason why this reduction failed and passwords like resulted in passwords to believe the third parties. And um, as a website owner, if you embed this like session replay scripts, you may also manually redact um, the parts of your page, for example, you may say, okay, this is nasty information. I don't want it to be collected. Okay. However, this is really, again, um, very fragile, um, like automated reduction may fail in, in this, for example, like show or hide password uh, um, feature, or may sometimes like a, a browser extensions that you have in tracks uh, with the session replay scripts and cause your passwords to be leaked. And um, in other case, um, this capital, like a university website, uh, login website, in this case, actually, two third party scripts were interacting in a way and leading the passwords to leak to this third party called user replay. Um, in addition, we found health related details leaking to full story again in one of the like, session recording companies on on Walgreens, which is like a very popular uh, farm like online pharmacy like uh, also like offline pharmacy and the, in this case, for example, the name of the prescribed drug is leaked and in another website called Gradescope, which is very very popular online grading and like, uh, um, a platform. Uh, student details this time lead to full story. And on Bonobos, it was credit card details again leaking to this company. We found actually that uh, these session recording uh, scripts are pretty widespread. Uh, we found like more than 14 companies offering these services. And there are present, like some scripts from them are present almost like on almost 100,000 websites, but not all of them are configured to do this session recording. And we found evidence of recording on almost, almost like 8,000 websites. And here are the like, companies offering these services. Um, session replay companies are marked as analytics. However, we found that some some other a few other uh, third parties also of like a, a collecting whole page contents, but for different purposes. For instance, for translation, or um, in in for example in the IntelliText case, uh, replacing certain keywords for um, links to advertisements. Okay, so the final measurement is that we did or the attack that we studied is social data exfiltration. So I'm sure you saw, you've seen a lot of like uh, websites that offer logging in through Facebook or Google, right? So this makes it very easy for the websites to log in users without maintaining maybe like a password or like user credentials themselves. And also it makes it super like seamless to sign up for our website. 
So the, the attack that we considered in this part of the paper is um, when you basically, uh, as a user, um, um, give access to the to the web page to access your to, to access your social um, network profile um, the third parties on the page may also uh, use this exposed data and read your social network data and send it to their servers okay so basically this is not all your facebook data or google data uh, so when you log in with facebook or google uh, only like part of your profile is um, um, can be accessed by the first party or the third party. So you basically uh, enable them to access, for example, your public profile or email address. And so to basically detect the scripts who basically abuse these social APIs, login log with social APIs, we basically replicated these social APIs um, say like a like object surface. So we um, spoofed all these Facebook's um, um, functions and objects that um, scripts may use to authenticate users and then read users' data. This included this like get login status or like a, a graph API calls, and uh, we basically try to return information that is. Um, uh, that matches the original original scripts. So this this is like a kind of shell around the Facebook's original original uh, SDKs. And the, so we found actually like seven scripts accessing um, some social network data, including user ID, email, gender, and but most of the time, also all the time, user ID. And only in three, uh, three of these seven cases, actually, we only verified access, like reading your user ID, but we couldn't actually uh, verify sending of the data. Uh, these are marked as unable to verify leak. Um, in, so some of these cases uh, were, for example, in some of the cases, the scripts were like heavily obfuscated and we had like a limited time to look into them. But in others, basically, we could verify reading and sending of this user ID to the third-party service. So this third parties, what, what do they do? So we looked into their marketing material. And so four of them, uh, on audience, Tialium, Lytx, ProPS, they are customer data platforms. Um, so basically helping publishers to monetize their users. Uh, for their kind of like an outlier, they say they uh, are an identity-based fraud prevention, pre prevention company. So maybe they are using this uh, social identity to prevent fraud. Um, Augur is a cross device tracking company, which also use some other uh, uh, like an invasive techniques. And, um, and the lastly, Nativka is a Russian company. They are, again offer like a traffic growth and content monetization services. Okay, so this was all like three studies and like some like it, like it's kind of different from the maybe other studies is we actually like, published these findings uh, in 2017 and 18. So like it's like almost all of these findings are already published um, as like series of blog posts. Okay, and the before publishing, of course, uh, we notified the respective parties, especially when there is a uh, like a security risk or privacy risk of for like further exposure and um, so this is like a time uh, like it passed since we published our findings uh, so you know you may see is a is a, like a kind of disadvantage that your our data or measurements are like kind of outdated uh, but also it gives us uh, like an unusual opportunity to look into like how things have changed um, maybe it's also like a reaction to our study um, because really, um, there were there was um, quite some like press coverage uh, on um, about our our uh, um, publications, like premium publications, and the like. So many websites actually um, um, stopped using these techniques that we actually explained here, and the so this table gives an overview. Um, Browsers such as Chrome, Firefox, Safari, and Brave all did something to, for example, 
uh, address the um, address the, for example, login manager abuse, especially Safari and Brave. Now they require interaction with the form, and Chrome and Firefox are considering like similar restrictions. And the for, um, for Safari and like I'm sorry, Brave and Firefox have like proposal to actually address social integration and DOM 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 exploitation attacks. Um, block list tracking protection block lists such as easy list and easy privacy uh, blocked the um, the third party scripts that we found in the login manager study and the third parties that we you know like investigated including like a thing on audience uh, full story index they all did something to fix or limit the exposure of the user data and Facebook uh, basically um, changed how these identifiers can be used, um, again, as a response to our study. Um, first parties, like major first parties, um, including Walgreens, Bonobos, and Great Scop, um, stopped using this session replay uh, scripts, again, as a response to our study. So it really has like a considerable impact um, uh, but unfortunately, these were mostly limited to specific vulnerabilities that we reported. But the root causes of the problem kind of remains this intact. First, like uh, same origin policy, that is this isolation is like all or nothing. You either isolate or not. There is no like, more granular, um, say, authorization. Um, although there are some like ongoing work on that front, I say. And the trust is transitive. That is, um, uh, like when you go to a web page, you can maybe trust it. And the, the web page trusts another third party, the third party trusts another party. So there's like a trust is kind of really kind of a chain, long chain of trust. And the first parties, maybe they don't all want to use this, some of these like scripts or technologies, but it's very difficult for them to implement. Uh, this same functionality or maybe get the configuration right to not expose user data. Okay, to wrap up, we studied the um, risks of including third parties on like 300,000 pages and found really invasive practices, including inserting invisible login forms to um, read in and exfiltrate users' credentials. Um, tapping into uh, social APIs to basically um, um, exfiltrate users' social identity. And finally, leaking passwords, health conditions, prescription data, credit card details, student data by session replay scripts that um, exfiltrate all page content. So our preliminary publications helped address some of these specific issues, but the, unfortunately the root cause of these problems remain unaddressed. And thanks for listening. That's all I have. Um, code and data will be available on this page. Thank you. Uh, any questions? Thank you, Ganesh. So just imagine that you're sitting in front of a room of people clapping their hands. Um, thank you, thank you. <laughs> so, um, if you have questions, please raise your hand and then I'll, um, I'll, I'll pick you up. So, the first question is from Andre. You should be unmuted now, Andre. Go ahead. Thanks very much uh, for an interesting talk, indeed. Thank you. Very cool findings. Uh, one thing you mentioned is that um, um, so you looked at the impacts uh, on the browser vendors and um, on the kind of, um, you know, on what has changed, which was very interesting to see kind of uh, what has happened since you first published the studies. Uh, I was wondering if there's a way to also measure the impact uh, on the tracking vendors in some way, mm -hmm. uh, since your detection technique was widely publicized. Mm -hmm. uh, presumably some of the tracking vendors also uh, kind of uh, found out about it. So I don't know if you saw any attempts to uh, evade the detection, for example. I guess, you know, in the detection of transmission, you're relying on comparing the bait with the original values. Mm -hmm. So for example, that's one thing that uh, uh, the attackers could try to tweak to exfiltrate mm -hmm. information in different ways. Yeah, that's a very good question, Andre. Uh, no, we haven't looked into that. Um, and 
That's definitely a possibility. And we mentioned that in the limitations of our work, basically almost all these say, um, like ad hoc measurement techniques or more like maybe any measurement techniques that's um, circumventable. That is like scripts may develop techniques to bypass, uh, especially when we make our code public and the, they may look into other ways of obfuscating data or using different channels to exfiltrate the data. Maybe not HTTP request, but say web sockets or web RTC or whatever new API we have today to send you know, some data to, to, to web servers. So there's definitely a concern and maybe like more say like fundamental approaches like you took such as you know information flow analysis uh, may better help may better uh, are better fits for um, um, measuring uh, despite this like a more adversarial um, uh, developments let's say 